<laughs> Good to go. All right. So you have the basic adventure and some players. But what's this you hear about a campaign? Well, lucky for you, I actually took a class on campaigns in college. And what I learned is that you want to focus your political ad bias towards the end of September through October and into early November. Now, that doesn't really have anything to do with what we're talking about here, but I really never get to use that knowledge in real life, so here it is. Now, in the context of Dungeons & Dragons, a campaign is something that can last a lot longer and can be far more grand. How you doing? I'm failed political operative, Legal Kimchi, and this is some DM Good Gaming. The campaign is an artifact of D&D's ancestry. Normally, a campaign is defined as a series of military operations designed to complete a specific goal. Think Sherman's March to the Sea or the North Africa campaign in World War II. Hmm? No, no, not ringing any... Really? Come on, guys, read more history books. Napoleon's invasion of Russia or the Japanese invasion of Korea in 1592? Still nothing? Okay. You see, D&D is a direct descendant of Chainmail, a fantasy medieval war game. As such, it inherited some of the terminology. A string of battles put together would be a single campaign. In D&D, a string of adventures put together turns into a single campaign. Whether you play like this or not, Dungeons & Dragons is actually a war game. Now, a lot of people mix up a campaign with the world or setting that your game takes place within. It's not actually what it is. Here's an example. Um, Critical Role. So, Critical Role Season 1 takes place in the world of Exandria, Matt Mercer's creation. And Critical Role Season 2 also takes place in Exandria. But they're two different campaigns. The setting can be intrinsically linked to the campaign, but they're not necessarily the same thing. Man, I am so behind on Critical Role. I don't even know where to get back into it. I was like halfway through season one when I stopped. Who's got four hours a week? No offense to those guys. So the campaign can be the overarching storyline, tying together all of the disparate adventures into one cohesive idea or story. They're the initial adventures of some low-level green adventurers to formidable heroes for hire, and ultimately to juggernauts that can affect the entire region or world. What's funny about this is that you don't actually need a campaign to start playing. You can actually just wing it and make it up as you go along. I do that a lot, but in my experience, it really helps to have at least the bare bones of a campaign set up before you begin. That way you can kind of nudge the adventures into the right direction when you need to. This is really helpful for setting up a really satisfying campaign for your players. Because the campaign is how you show your players that their choices matter. To me, this is the whole point of an RPG, what separates it from every other game that you can play. Tabletop or otherwise. I mean, you can see other games trying to adapt these mechanics. To a certain extent, computer RPGs do that and try to give you meaningful choice. Although if Mass Effect 3 is any indication, sometimes there's not really that much meaning to it. Though I've even seen other tabletop games adopt mechanics established in role-playing games and importing them into it. Like the legacy board games that you might see around, like Legacy Risk or Pandemic Legacy. These games have mechanics incorporated where you can actually alter the board and affect future plays of the game. This helps with the sensation of making it your game. My Risk Legacy board is not going to look like anyone else's, and it reflects the history of me and my friends battling over the planet over and over and over again. With regards to the separation between campaigns and world, I run the same world for all of my D&D games, and yet the campaigns are wildly different, with the choices that the players make having wildly different effects on the world that they're playing in. I've had my world for a while now, and multiple groups have played in it, and the landscape, power structures, and NPCs have behaved wildly different based on their choices. I actually have an occasion of players in my group ask me, wait a minute, is this how another group handled the same problem? And sometimes I gotta be honest with them and say, they never faced this problem. They didn't make the choices necessary in the beginning of the campaign to get to this point. 
So what does this mean to you? Well, most of the time campaigns develop naturally over time. It's how your player characters interact with the world, and how the world, in turn, interacts with your player characters. Now that being said, we may go into world building in a later video. Now structuring your campaign to a certain extent is key. This is the story, so to speak. Having it too rigid makes it so that the players don't have any real choices. Having it too fluid can... Show the cracks in the seams if your players are being astute and observant. So you want to try to hit that nice middle ground. But when you get it right, it's the meat and potatoes of the entire D&D experience. For me, it's what keeps me coming back to the table year in, year out. It's why I enjoy being a DM. That and I have a god complex. It's really bad, guys. I like to look at the D&D campaign as like a... Um, TV show. Each session is like an episode. There needs to be sort of a monster of the week flavor, a problem so that the players can solve so they feel like they've accomplished something in the session. When you don't have that inside of the individual sessions, it can get into a little bit of slog and your players can come out of the three hours that you've been playing feeling like they never accomplished anything. So I like to use the pace of an episode as an example. I will have like a short recap at the beginning of the session so that we can figure out where we are. Usually this is done by a player, sometimes because I don't remember what happened in the last session. This may seem weird, but with my DM style, I do very little prep in between week-to-week -week sessions. Uh, a lot of that comes down to I don't have a lot of time to do prep in between sessions. Work, kids, doing this stuff, also being really lazy. There are certain times, like this week, well, at least the week that I'm recording this episode, where the D&D session is sort of in the middle of something, so it's a hot start, no recap really necessary. We're just gonna blaze right into the encounter that we left off from last week. Sometimes it's a combat session. Sometimes it's a really tense role-playing moment. Sometimes it's the players going back and forth as to what decision they wanna make moving forward. Always make sure to start them off and let them resolve that situation. And, if you start a session in the middle of a situation like that, try to resolve it before the end of the session. Otherwise, again, players feel like they didn't accomplish anything. That doesn't mean they have to finish everything for that particular adventure in that session. I mean, try to think of it sometimes as a multi-part episode if it gets really tense. Then, once you have cleared out that tense situation, give them a little downtime and establish the next tense situation. Now. Let's think about the entire adventure as a whole. I'm talking sort of more classical adventures as opposed to the modern D&D &D adventures that they're publishing right now. We'll get to that in just a second. But I'd like to think of the old adventures as a season of a TV show. The adventure has an overarching task that needs to be accomplished. Sometimes this is a monster at the end of the dungeon. Sometimes it's a cult that needs to be revealed. Sometimes it's a murder that needs to be solved. I mean, it kind of depends on what you're doing. And inside of each of these adventures, there are sort of mini missions. You've got to run this errand for the alchemists so that they can brew the potion that's necessary to uh, make the guards go to sleep or something of that nature. Sometimes the sessions can bleed into each other because you're trying to complete these tasks within the storyline of the adventure itself. And just like a television season or series, your one adventure can actually lead and plant the ideas for the next adventure. Now I absolutely love this, but beyond the session to session episodic gameplay and then the sort of television season adventure gameplay, I usually have this thing happening in the background. Maybe two or three things, actually. It's the emergence of a big bad evil guy. It's the hints and rumors that tie everything together. In fact, the campaign is sort of the big bad guy in the background. You can think of it like Baldur's Gate from 1998. Did I just age myself by just commenting on that video game? I loved it. I played it a lot. It consumed my world for a long time. Now, if you're unfamiliar with that game, it's a D&D computer game where you start off as this ward in this library city and you go off on an adventure with your mentor. Now, he gets killed and you try to find your way in the world. You figure out that there's some trouble brewing. You head down there and clear the mine, and it turns out it's all a part of this unraveling conspiracy about this one guy who wants to be the god of murder. So even though in that initial adventure the bad guy is some cleric and you're fighting a bunch of kobolds, there's this background hint of 
this character that wants to be the god of murder. So you laid the foundation that a big bad evil guy is waiting in the shadows, but you don't see him. Then you do the next adventure, and the next one, and he still doesn't show up, but there's always hints and rumors in the background. That's brilliant. That's how you're supposed to do it when you do it well. Now don't be discouraged if you can't do it like that initially. It takes time and practice to learn how to get that done. What that big bad evil guy is can be different for different people. For instance, like for mine, it is uh, an old character that I used to play back in the 90s when I actually was a player of D&D as opposed to the DM of D&D. Although that's me being hypocritical, see my first video. So I had this character named Calebon. He was an elven blade singer in second edition, and he was absolutely fantastic. Loved him. Everything about him, he was great. Uh, so I played this guy for a bunch of levels, kept leveling him up, and uh, I don't know, generally enjoyed him, then he retired. So I just transported him. Now he is this adventurer who went off, got his riches, got his magical items, and then established himself as king, then called himself emperor, and is on a crusade to conquer the entire world under his lone banner. The idea behind this is he's going to create a peaceful, unified world, but he will do it by any means necessary. He's been corrupted by his righteous fury into this tyrannical dictator and he fancies himself able to ascend to the next level, to Godhood. Now, the players know about this guy. He shows up in the background, but they never actually see him. They never actually face him. Their first level, there's no way he would wipe the floor with them easily. He's like the all-seeing eye of Lord Sauron. And like the Lord of the Rings, there are many bosses that the adventurers will fight far before they ever faced Calebon. They are the Knights of the Mauls, the Emperor's shock troop. One of them would be a challenge for low-level characters. Maybe it's the Duke of Castillet, who may or may not have murdered the previous Duke of Castillet. Perhaps he had the support of the Emperor in doing so, so I kind of stole that from Dune. Maybe later on, they're fighting the Lady Genike, an elven queen corrupted by vengeance. Now all of these bad guys may have ties to the Emperor, some positive, some negative but they all link back in some way. They all have their own stories. They're all connected. And you actually see this all the time. A really good recent example of how to do this would probably be the Marvel Cinematic Universe. I mean, think about it. Iron Man comes out and they start talking about the Avengers Initiative. And then later on, you hear whispers and four or five second clips of this Thanos guy coming. Like in Avengers, in that last scene, you see Loki, he had his army, but you're always wondering, where did Loki get this army? Where's his power coming from? How is he getting all this stuff to try to find the Tesseract? And then they hint Thanos. Well, Thanos is the emperor, and they played that out for six years? before the fight with Thanos actually occurred. And even prior to Thanos appearing, they kept hinting at these Infinity Stones. They knew what they were doing in the beginning. That's what we're going for here, folks. Each of those movies can be considered an adventure, and over time, they seem like different stories, but they all link together. And the campaign, ultimately, is all of those heroes fighting Thanos. So if you were going to write the campaign of the Marvel Cinematic Universe, there it is. Iron Man is an adventure. Thor is an adventure. Captain America First Avenger is an adventure. The Avengers is an adventure. The campaign is the fight against Thanos. I mean, honestly, it wouldn't even be that difficult to make a D&D fantasy version of the Marvel Cinematic Universe using the structure of the movies and creating a campaign setting out of it. Actually, that would probably be pretty fun. If you want to see me do that, comment in the section down below. So, my advice to you is watch movies, watch TV shows, read a series of books, and steal from them. All of them. At least the ones that are good. Now let's get into the Wizards of the Coast adventures that they're releasing right now. Now, I have to be honest, I don't use them. In my opinion, they're a little too long and structured. They're not as modular as the old adventures used to be, and I kind of love that style. I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that I was raised on that. Coming into D&D during first edition AD&D and then really getting into it um, in second edition, because that's what my family played, uh, and third edition, which is kind of where my love for the hobby died a little bit. No offense to third edition lovers, it wore me out. The current adventure structure that Wizards of the Coast is using are these adventures that actually take players from 1st to 15th level and have that overarching storyline. I mean, to me, these are campaigns. 
and the mini missions or sections inside of them, they're the adventures. And don't get me wrong, while I don't use those personally because it's my own personal style, I am in no way saying that you shouldn't use those. In fact, I actually love that they produce these things. I just wish they would produce the modular stuff as well. Because I think these long form campaigns that they publish for you are fantastic resources, especially for new DMs. If you have that type of structure, you can see from professionals, from people like myself who have been doing this for years, uh, except their job is literally to create and write this down for you, ways and tricks and tips that you can steal for when you make your own. And that to me, man, that's the joy. Making your own D&D settings, campaigns, adventures, that's why I love this hobby so much. Because it's just... It scratches that creative itch, okay? It's writing without writing. It's creating entertainment except collaboratively with your friends. But if I'm being honest, there's also a part of me that hates it. As a heavily improvisational DM, there is, in my opinion, a lot less room for that type of improvisation within the campaign structure that Wizards of the Coast is currently producing. Because of that lack of modular content, I can't just pick up something and put it somewhere else and then finagle it to make it fit. I still, I still do that on occasion, to be perfectly honest with you, but it just makes it a lot harder for me. And if it's hard for me, I can imagine it would be very daunting for a new DM. And I think that's a disservice because with a modular setup with small bite adventures you can basically grab four five six adventures file the serial numbers off and then make them your own change the names maybe the big bad guy who's starting a cult in the adventure that you just used is starting a different type of cult one that fits better to your campaign and it'll link up to the next adventure about this fortress near the border of this wild land and the craziness that's happening in the caves beyond you probably know which adventures i'm talking about i can change the names the places the monsters even and keep the general structure of what's happened in the adventure you don't need to change much to make it fit just a little bit of foreshadowing here and there and they'll tie together. You want to be careful not to be too heavy-handed on it, or your players will see it as sort of like a flashing light. Either way, feel free to use the resources that help you. As new DMs, I very highly recommend picking up the Ravenloft book from Wizards of the Coast, or any of the new long-form mega-adventure campaigns that they're currently publishing. Steal from it. But when you're playing those, think of how you would change it. Think of what you would want to steal, what you would want to shift so it fits into a narrative you want to tell. When you're thinking like that as you're playing, well at that point, you're getting to be a really good DM. Thanks for watching folks. Remember, if you like the video, hit that like button. Feel free to comment down below if you have any suggestions for future videos or things that you would like to see us do on this channel. Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell icon so you can get notifications whenever we upload new videos. Oh and remember folks, roll dice, roll play and roll with it.